Still yes, going. we're recording. We're recording. We are All the lights are on. Um, horrible admission. <laughs> Michael Schmidt and I have already been sitting on this couch for about half an hour, t- happily talking, um, and I didn't notice that the camera, the battery in you, camera, ran out. Um, and I have a new recording device that I'm still getting used to, and I hadn't taken it off of pause, so yeah, I don't even have the audio version of. So it was nice talking with you. Thanks for coming by. You're very, very welcome. And uh, you know, safe travels. Thank you. <laughs> Shortest podcast ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Deal. Boing. Welcome to the Aquia Podcast. Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. Welcome to the Aquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. We are sitting in my office in Cologne, the office that I share with the Code Themer Wonder Twins, mm-hmm. Campbell Bertessi and... Adam Duran. Do they actually fight like during the day sometimes? Like so they... I'm kind of like the office dad. And I literally used to walk in and catch them practicing kung fu, karate, <laughs> fighting stuff. And I got really upset with them. And so they never do it when I'm around. Oh, <laughs> so they have a jam signal somewhere? Well, jam I don't know, but it was... <laughs> I literally walked in the office sometimes and they'd be like... <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't cool with it. Anyway, th- this couch in the office is kind of turning into the podcast couch. Mm-hmm. I've spoken with a few people here. Campbell and I did a podcast with the PHP unit maintainer, Sebastian Bergman, who doesn't live too far away. I had the um, HR vice president from Hootsuite here, which was really, really cool, talking about putting open source methodologies and thinking into HR, which is, Ooh, nice. yeah, really very interesting. Now, I have Michael Schmidt, CTO of the, um, it's funny for me to say it, but CTO of the Amazi Group, Correct. which today uh, comprises three global offices, mm-hmm. uh, Zürich, Austin, Cape Town, mm-hmm. plus a company called Amazi Metrics. How many people work for Amazi Labs nowadays? All together... I think it's 34, 35, something like that. Okay, that's a that's an interesting size. It's it's a good size, yeah. So um, one of the things is that we say is that we don't want to grow too big in each location. So we want to keep the locations rather smaller. So there's like a, a number of 80, 90 people because we feel that's a really nice size that is still... The team, everybody knows each other, we can sit together at the table. But again, we still have, we want to grow as a whole company, so that's why we have the different locations. So in total, we have more than 18 people with like 33 all over the world. Right, and if you have three locations, then these locations can grow to 60 people, and then you're going to have to open more offices. Correct, yes. Okay, cool. Now, Amazi, amazingly, has been around for just about 10 years. Correct. Next year, it's 10 years anniversary. And you didn't start as a digital agency at all. Not at all. Back when I first heard of you, somebody told me there is this Drupal site Mm -hmm. called Mm Amazie.com. And you can use it for fundraising or something. Now, cast your minds back 10 years ago, there, um, there, there weren't... Uh, there wasn't Kickstarter, and there wasn't Indiegogo. Nope. Right? What was Amazie.com for? So the main idea was to provide a platform for people to organize their groups and projects online. Uh-huh. Like Kickstarter didn't exist. Facebook groups didn't exist. Uh-huh. Um, and other Basecamp, I think, was around, but not used for the things that, that we use it today. So the idea was to have a platform where people, if they have an idea, they can create a project page, can invite people to their page, and they can share, communicate, and organize themselves. You had a blog, you had a news feed, you had a picture gallery, you had file sharing, 
you had private messaging, you had a forum. It was all the tools we use today in different platforms all on one. And also, we also had fundraising. So a lot okay. of people thought that we are a fundraiser. But for us, the fundraising was just another piece on the right side of a project page that you can also enable if you want to. And yeah, so that's what we, we started with. That's an awful lot of functionality in one place. Yes, I made once a list of all the functionality and I probably ended up by like 55 features that the website had. Huh. Now, amazing.com as a platform is not around anymore. Right. What was what was great about it and what doomed it to fail? What was great about it is that we had an investor that gave a massive money into it and we can we could really sit down and implement whatever we wanted. And so and anybody that brought up an idea, like couldn't you do that and let's not do that and you know what we could also combine that we implemented it. Like, we made a lot of people happy. Like, basically everybody was the product manager of the website. If somebody brought an idea, we implemented it. Uh -huh. And that was great because we had a small group of people that used it. We had really good connections with these people. They came into the office and told us what they wanted to use it for. That was awesome. The problem was, at the same time, we had so many features that it was really hard to explain what it was. Still, I cannot explain it to you right now in one sentence. Okay, so you didn't have, a, it was not elevator pitchable. No, not at all. <laughs> it was hard to use because you had so many different functionalities. The pr also problem was a lot of people used it for completely different things. Mm. So marketing it was really hard. Selling it was really hard. So it sounds like it's kind of the difference with sort of between Drupal when you first turn it on, which can be anything, yeah. and some software as a service thing where I go log in and I've got a user journey that goes from A to B to C to Correct. done in, in a very focused way. Correct. Yes. And so that's also the reason why it doesn't exist anymore. We, we had so many features on it, and it was so hard to maintain them. It was really hard to make them really, really nice from a usability point of view. And um, because at the beginning, we didn't give a lot of shit about usability. We just implemented it and it was like, yeah, well, yeah, there's a checkbox bottom right that you have to click first before you can click the one above, like all these horrible usability mistakes. But um, so we had a lot of features. And then at one point we ran out of money. Like we had an investor, he gave us money. And at one point we will have all it used, but we never may, we were never able to make our own money. So the idea was to have um, premium accounts where people pay per month. And advertising, and we barely made any money. Mm. So, this was in Drupal 5. Yes. And Amazie is still doing, Amazie Global Enterprises Inc. is <laughs> still doing Drupal. Yes. So, you had a chance, it sounds like, to really learn Drupal and get a lot of things wrong. What yes. was the transition into becoming Amazy Labs and doing Drupal? Uh, what's the old saying? Doing Drupal like it's our job? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a platform and we didn't make enough, enough money to sustain ourselves as a company. So we were really thinking and the first idea was to cut down features, to implement better features, make them. So we threw out half of all the functionality and implemented that better. But again, it was just we didn't have enough time. So... At the same time, other companies came to us and said, hey, we really like the tool that you've built. Can we have it, but with our logo on top? Mm. So we started doing white labeling solutions. At the beginning, we were like, no, 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 we don't want to do that. It's not our focus. It's not our business model. We just learned we have to focus. That's not. But it was the only way to make money. So we did that. We did three projects. Focus on paying your rent. Yes. <laughs> so we did three projects, white labeling solutions, so-called where people can do, or we build websites, the same functionality, different theme, maybe a slightly different functionality in terms of like how some things behaved. And um, yeah, the problem was after the third site, the requests of the clients were bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so can you change the front page? Can you do that? I want to have, I please remove that, but add that in. We need, we need an integration in that. And at the same time, the Drupal community went on. Drupal 6 came out a lot of modules were much better. We were still stuck in Drupal 5. Upgrading the whole thing to 6 looked um, impossible. And then 
we realized, hey, the community is so far now, we can do everything with Drupal 6. We don't have to use our own tool that we implement. We don't have to use the white labeling again anymore. We can just use Drupal, what it is, out of the box with all the country modules. So we did the first, pro first project there, and somehow it was much better because the mm. tools were more advanced, it was easier to work with, and so we just keep doing that. So we implemented more and more things with a completely fresh Drupal version. So at, at that point, tell me between then and now, why did you stick with Drupal? It was the thing that, we, that we've done. There was not a question. Oh, and of, it was working? It was working. We, we made our clients happy. We, I mean, it has a lot of Drupalisms. I mean, Drupal 6, it's like if you try to... There was no ob ob objectivity in the code. Was, everything was completely different than any other PHP tool out there. Um, but we were small. We had a really good knowledge about it. And we were really happy because, especially at that point, the whole site building part that you can set up the site without actually needing to code, that was, for me, was a really cool tool that you can use in a lot of different ways. Mm. And if you need to change something, you just go in there and change it. And so that's why we, that was never the question if you want to switch, whatever. We were really happy with the tool that we had. April Fool's Day, yes, 2014. Correct. What happened? So Drupal 8 was in Alpha 6 or so at that point. And we... We're talking about like, hey, what we would, what, what do we want to do for April Fool's Day? So one idea that we had is let's relaunch our website in Drupal 8. And so we did it, but we did it in the Bartik theme. So we set up a Drupal 8 site. We copied all the content over from the, from, from the Drupal 7 site and we just launched in Bartik. The Maze Labs would come completely blue. Bartik. So like that classic... Ugly as old classic Drupal, as it gets. As Drupal as it gets yes, as well. as Drupal as it gets. And we launched. And nobody got it. Like everybody wrote us saying, like, hey, there is something wrong because the wrong theme is loaded. Because because nobody's using Bartik. Oh, well, for also, site. as Amazie is quite you know known for doing nice design as Correct. well. Correct. So yeah. you'd never actually no, you, do nobody that. would be. Yes. <laughs> and so everybody was sort of like, hey, you know, like people wrote me, you know, I had the problem the same. Like in my, I, I, I tried it myself and yeah, it loads Bartik all the time. <laughs> so go to Drupal.org and there's an issue that explains to you why Bartik is loaded. And we were like, no, no, it's all good. We're, we're super happy. It's Drupal 8. Yay. And it was Drupal 8. Like it was all good. And um, yeah, 2nd April, we announced, yeah, sorry, it was only April, and then one in April 4. But what we actually started already in February 2014, we started to implement our site in Drupal 8 already with a proper theme. So end of April 2014, we launched our Drupal 8 at drupalmeeslabs.com in Drupal 8 Alpha 6 something with a proper theme and also multilingual. Now, that made it one of the first three, four, five, ten public public Drupal 8, 8 yeah. websites, and it's been online in Drupal 8 since then. Yes, we were talking before uh, about how that ended up preparing your company, your team, to hit the ground running. So essentially, you had a kind of a of a Drupal 8 boot camp, <laughs> something like that, yeah. going on from. Uh, early 2014, almost two years before Drupal 8.0 hit. What are the kind of things that you and your team had to do um, to keep the site in Drupal 8 and keep up with the, the releases that were going on? So that was a really big worry from the beginning because we knew there will be no upgrade path. And what I was really hoping when I took the decision with the team that we want to do it in 8 is that Yes, there will be pain in upgrading it because most of it you have to re-implement or you re-implement a new and then you make your own migration script. And that's what we actually did. So we migrated, I think, four times and all the time it took at least around 40 hours of work. And we wrote big migration scripts and we published all of them because we said, hey, if anybody else is as crazy as we are, right. here is the code that we wrote. But configuration at that point was still not all in YAML files. And then the the Twig implementation wasn't finalized at all and APIs yes. were not even yeah. frozen. No, it's it was like, yeah, we, and that is also the thing that I was really hoping for is that when we have to upgrade, 
is that we have to go into a depthness of Drupal 8 to understand what really has changed that we learn more about it. And mm. that's exactly what happened. My team told me that while working in the older versions and upgrading it, they learned so much about the inner workings of Drupal 8 that now they feel more comfortable in even now implementing production sites. Because, you know... Even if it's at a level that they don't touch on a daily basis? Correct. Because they... Is that because they, they understand why the system is like yes. it is now? Yes. So like now, if you see a white screen of death in Drupal 8, that's like, fuck, now I have to use a step debugger and what figure out. For my team, that was part of the upgrading. Oh. Like basic upgrading is just, okay, put the new code, start the site, white screen of death. Okay, step debugger, step, 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 fixing, next, next bug. It's just something, the whole, the whole situation of failing or of handling a tool and trying to figure out what is... So they've lived in it. They've yes, lived in yes. it. Yes. They, they embraced the, the situation of... And now the team is not afraid of even now... In, like the same problem we have now with all of our versions of contract modules all the time. You install it, boom, white page. And that's not something bad because we under, we know we have tools to go into the code, mm -hmm. step debugging and, and profiling and figuring out what's happening. And also... A lot of things, you know, they're the same things are broken all the time. And like it's basically in the beginning, like the whole menu system broke, uh, changed, breaking changes in the menu system. All country modules are broken. If you fix one, you know how to fix the other one. Ah. So, so it's just like a, we learned a lot of things. And also what I really liked is we were up to date of what is happening in the community. The community took a lot of decisions and the, all these decisions affect us now. And for people that just start doing Drupal 8 right now, they're confronted with all these changes. And a lot of the changes, you don't know why. But for us, because we were part of it, we understood because we had to work with them. You read through the issue queues. Mm. You go, you read the change notice and you understand, oh, that's why this is like that. And so... Now, when we implement it, we know why things are like that and you understand them more and you embrace them more and you like them more because you know why mm. things have changed. How much did that let you contribute to Drupal 8 along the way? So um, one of the things that I realized is with just doing it, we contributed a lot. Like just that people can say, hey, it is already, there are already production sites live. Helped a lot because um, people believe, started to believe in it. Uh -huh. um, and I had a lot of people that just came to me and said, like, you know, I, I, I would have never done it, but it's good that you've done it because you showed it's possible. I gave presentations at, like, Drupal Can, uh, DrupalCon Austin that I showed, hey, you can build production sites. And a lot of people walked out of there and said, I'm going to do it now because mm. it, you showed me it's possible. And so that was one contribution that I only realized later on that was one. One of them that we totally did, whenever we found a bug, whenever we found a country module that was broken um, and we fixed it, we contributed patches. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of tiny pieces of patches that, um, but a lot of them that say like, because one other thing that I see a bit of the Drupal 8, how we implement it before, actually it's got, somebody's going to use it in real life. A lot of cases you never figure out. Like I was part of the multilingual team and we, and I was thinking, okay, we figured everything out. And then you start the first site and you realize, wait, what do I do if that blog post is in English, but not in German, but in French? Like, so like all these, these cases that you never thought about. Uh -huh. And we ran into all of them. Okay. And, and the one other thing is also the whole experience of a person starting to use it. Like, I'm really sorry, but for everybody that um, there was a breaking change a couple of days before the go live, which where we changed the staging directory of CMI to sync directory and we throw away the active directory. Because this was one thing for the people in the CMI team, which are brilliant. I mean, I love them that they implemented CMI, but they are so deep into the system. For them, it was completely clear why the whole thing was called staging. My developers started using it and they saw a staging folder and said like, so is that the folder where the configuration for the staging site goes? It's not. But I had five people asking me the same question in three days because they all started using Drupal. And I realized, oh wow, there is, there is a problem. If we, if we, if we don't change that now, we will have 
thousands of people all over the world. Mm. So we had the possibility to give it to new people that didn't use it before and ask them for like, how does it feel in using it? And they're like, you know, there's some really strange okay. stuff. And the good stuff is we could still fix it. Ah, so... So that was that was actually getting it out in the wild early yes. helped make it a better production system later. Correct. Yes. Now, as a as a business person, as a as a digital agency, you I'm sure so first of all, your first experience, you were your own worst client. Correct. Because you asked for every feature in the world and you gave it to yourself. Yes. How do you have how does that inform your conversations with clients today? Oh, a lot. We have so many clients that come to us and say like, you know, I want to have a combination of, you know, why never implemented somebody with Flickr and Facebook and let's, uh, let's add some Amazon in there and then a sprinkle of Azure, whatever. Like if we would, if somebody would build that, that would be the best tool. I have the killer business model. Correct. <laughs> Facebook and Flickr. Or I don't know. And, and, and I mean, there used to be a lot of discussions that I explained them, but now we have an actual case. We can show them, look, this is the amount of money that we spent ourselves. And it was a lot of money that we burned with Amazicon. Um, and we can tell them from first hand, first experience. And then they somehow trust you more because they see, okay, you went through it and you explain them all the pain that we went through. And then they really start to listen to you and believe you that if you just focus on one thing, if you do that really well, then you can add another feature and then you can add another feature. Because one thing that I painfully learned with Amazing.com, we had a lot of features. All of them were kind of broken. We looked which of the features are actually used. And we said, okay, these five features are only used by a super, super, super tiny amount of percentage of people. And we kick them out. But you get emails, angry emails of maybe that single person that used it. And so you feel really bad because you made somebody unhappy. If you implement five features first, that person would have never had that experience of you took away something from me. So implement five features first, make them really good, and then add a second, or add a sixth, a seventh, and an eighth. And that's also much better from a marketing point, because you can go out and say, hey, we added another feature, then we're really sorry we removed it. Uh -huh. So focus is important. Focus is ultra important. Talk about your, um, the, your, your functionality formula for clients. So... Whenever I want these 30 things, yes, go. Yes. Whenever, whenever we see like a feature set, and especially if the budget is tight, I mean, that's feature creep and, and tight budget. And then you tell them that's not possible. So what we started to use at Amazi, um was remove every feature till it starts to hurt. Like where you feel comfortable and say like, yeah, what's the case? Yes. So this is with a client. Yes. And you get them to the point where they can't possibly cut anything yes. out. Yes. So you go there and it's already a hard point. And then, and you, then say, you tell them, now we cut again by half. You're allowed to have half of these. Yes. <laughs> and it's a really painful process. But if they understand that it's still, and that's so good about, um, about the web, how the IT, you can add new things at any time. You can swap out new things. It's not like a house where you can say, okay, now I don't like the basement. Let's change it. Mm. That's not possible in the house. I mean, it is, but it's probably really, really hard because if you leave the house, change it. And it's <laughs> in, in the web, that's not how it works. And so we can change things on the way. We right. can learn from experiences and we can add new things. We can remove stuff. So the more focus you have from the beginning, the earlier you will go live the earlier you will have real user feedback and the earlier you will be sure that in the direction that we go, is that actually the correct direction or not? Right, because it could be that 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 the direction that you think that the project or the, yes. the product is going to go is not where people actually take it. Not at all. And, I mean, and if you give them too much chance to go and do whatever they want with your 55 features, then you will upset them when you eventually pivot away from that. Correct. And, and also, you will never be able to launch 55 functionalities in a really good usability right. and, and functionality. Way. And the the, the 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 way that I explain this to people essentially is uh you know the majority of people spend the majority of their time now on the internet on their pocket supercomputers. Yes. Right? And on the phone screen I'm gonna be able to fit in three things for you. 
right? So what is your business really about? What is it? So what are the three things that people need to be able to see and understand about you the first time they go to your yeah. site? Um, because it's much easier to add than to take away. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's cool. Now, I have this feeling that Drupal 8 is the most productized Drupal and that it does give us an incredibly useful, focused feature set out of the box compared to any previous version of Drupal where we had, you know, poll module and blog module and things that were useful to a certain subset of people, but you couldn't turn them off. They had to be there. Um, I have a feeling that, that Drupal 8 is really focused now. What do you think about that? Yes. Um, one thing that we had to learn um, with when we started two years ago, there was no country module at all. But there was views in core and there were like entity references and all these things were there. So we, a lot of things we realized, okay, we have to work with the existing tools. And that forced us to rethink how we do stuff. A lot of times in seven, there's a module for that. We all say that and you install it, but actually you could have implemented with the tools that are already there. You don't need a module for that. And so that's where I really like AAA that we, it's like that the tools that are in there allow you to do a lot of great things without the adding more country modules. Right. And, and just the fact that every data object is an entity. Yes. And every entity is fieldable. Yes. And oh, fields are also entities, so they're fieldable, right? Um, you have a universal uh, set of CRUD operations, a universal way of addressing them and manipulating yes. them. So in Drupal 8, all. right, a user and a comment and a node and a awesome. whatever it else is all, it are all equal citizens. Correct. Right. Yes. And for me, that's the focus. Like we focused on unifying things where in seven you had to learn, okay, the menu IP works different than the user and the node and the taxonomy. But this allows you to take this basic building set of the single download that works really well and take it much, much further than, than, than any other Drupal was able to go. Correct. Correct. And we, we had so many experiences where we said like, Oh no, that's not possible. We, we need a country module for it. And then it just took an hour. <clears throat> sitting on a white screen or on a, on a whiteboard together with the team and starting brainstorming to realize suddenly, hey, we can actually, with the block system, the entity references and nodes and content types and custom blocks, you can do it. And and that was one thing that I really felt confident and still feel confident in implementing big Drupal 8 sites right now, even though the country modules are maybe not there yet. Um, do you think that we'll need fewer uh, contrib modules in the end for Drupal 8 because the the core is more capable? I 100% believe that. Right. Um, if I look at the sites that we, the size of sites that we build right now in 8, I would say they're like middle size. They're not only the small ones. We go to the middle ones. We're not really building the really, really big ones. But if I compare the middle size amount of country modules compared to the same, what, what I would need in 7, yeah, it's Probably a third of country modules. Well, so, but the best example of your case in a country with four official languages, Correct. right? Everything you build in Switzerland essentially has to be multilingual Correct. with at least two languages. Yes. Probably three or four. Four, sometimes five. Yeah. So multilingual is really important to you. And in Drupal 7, to build a really properly localized, translatable website, you needed 27, 30 Modules, Something around there. And then it was really, really hard, and they were built at different times in different ways, and it was a lot of work, right? Yeah. Now, you don't need any contrib modules, because you can turn on four modules in core. Correct. Um, how is that experience working with multilingual? Like, how much time do you save on multilingual projects now, would you say? It's... I wouldn't say we save a lot of time yet, because we added some new things in there that are unknown, like config translation mm -hmm. is not really, did not exist in Drupal 7. So that is like to understand the workings of that. Um, there is only entity translation, which is now called content translation, but it's the entity translation of Drupal 7. We, I think like three or four years ago, we decided we're only going to use the entity translation for Drupal 7, but still it is a bit different. Um, so overall, I would definitely say it's a much better experience in terms of 
how many modules you need to install, how many different things are. But there are still new stuff that you have to understand. Okay, so, so we're still spending a lot of time in understanding. Also, one other problem is that contrib modules, they're maybe not so multilingual aware. Like we just had e big issues with paragraphs. Um, that how you translate them, um, it works though, but it's just more like how to learn, how to understand how it works and stuff like that. Okay, so you're still in the learning curve for really wrapping your heads around the possibilities that it offers Correct. you. Yes. And um, you'd say the core systems work great, contrib is still catching up, and yes. module developers need to understand and acknowledge these possibilities and build them in? Yes, well, we try as core to basically... Um, make it as transparent as possible for every contrib developer. But still, there are things, especially like paragraphs, which adds, like, it, which loads entities for you based on another entity. And you just need to make sure that, like, the the whole, the translation objects or the language objects are passed in. Right. So it's it's not a bit of understanding exactly how it works. It's just hand, using the API is correct. Okay. And, um, and that's a bit of a process that happens right now. But if we figured that all out... I would totally believe that in the future, probably next six months or so, we're probably double as fast in doing multilingual science mm. and stuff like that. Fantastic. Of course, Paragraphs as a module is a perfect uh, perfect example of this, um, you know, now in Drupal 8, that everything's an entity and fieldable and fieldable and fieldable Correct. and field because it's just an entity with a bunch of things packed into it uh, as as references now. Correct. Yes. Um, I don't even, I don't even, like, I haven't looked at the code for the Drupal 7 version. Um, I don't even know how, how they would have. That's exciting. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's other things. Like, one really fun one is I had multiple people in the team that used meta tags for Drupal 7. Drupal 7, you install it, <coughs> and it's all there. Drupal 8, there's nothing there. You install the module, empty. And you go to the content type, and it's like, where? Where do I put the meta tag? Like, and you see, like in the Slack channel, it's like, hey, like I mean, it's all meta tags. And the, and the fun is actually there is if you go to the configuration page, it only shows you one field, and it's called phone number. There's a special reason that is that. But people are like, no, the module is broken, whatever. That's not work. And then they search more, and they realize meta tags are now a field. Yes. And with people, if you see, if you if they look at that, and you see their mind like poof. Like they realize, oh, it's a field, so I can meta tag users and I can meta tag nodes and I can meta tag. There's like, then that's like this, the point where people understand like a lot, like all these puzzle pieces like flowing around and suddenly they're connect and then they're really strong. Uh, da Damien is the maintainer of meta tags, right? I think so, yeah. He, he and I were talking and he was uh, the, the, at the point when we were talking about it, they, they were, um, working on getting the module really, really solid. And then they're actually going to put in a lot more default tags for people to find. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's not quite there yet. They're really heavy working on it right now. But that's, I mean, we use paragraphs for everything, right? No, now. no, meta tag. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we use meta tag on every site because you need it everywhere. Like a, a website without meta tags. I mean, yeah. I think you miss a lot of things out if you if you're not properly giving meta tags to search engines and crawlers and stuff like that. Well, so I think the 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 final and biggest question on my mind mm -hmm. about Drupal eight now. We're in early 2016. It's been out for five or six months. It looks like it's starting to pick up. Contrib is starting to catch up. Uh, lots and lots of modules are being migrated to Drupal 8. See my Drupal 8 module for the week blog post series, please, on dev.acqui.com. I'm having a lot of fun doing it. it. It feels like we're in a good place. It feels like Drupal 8 is the technology that we were hoping for, that it's still relevant. How does it feel for you? What do you see um, in our future? And most of all, how is it working with Drupal 8 on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. for, for, for clients? It feels like the things that everybody was waiting for, everybody was desperately waiting for, that it was, on one point, it was really good that we implemented all the things that it took so long. On the other side, it was really painful, but that is all over now. It's out there. Use it and try it. And it really feels something that 
in the days of working, it feels complete. It feels really good. It everybody's happy in terms of like backend developers are really happy about how the whole system works on a on a on a PHP level. Frontend developers are super happy about the Twig. And now um, we see all these new modules coming up, like Big Pipe or um, Refresh Less, that now just recently came out. I mean, when I saw that, it's like mind blown. Yeah, and I think. There will be so many more modules. I thought that cache tagging was insane. No. <laughs> I thought that Big Pipe was insane. Refreshless, I didn't even know that we could. Yes, and I believe, I honestly <laughs> believe, there will be so many more things coming out that we are surprised in how less code we have to write to implement a specific functionality because you just have to change how it works a bit and then you have a completely new functionality or people coming up with really cool tools or modules or plugins or whatever it is on how to use the existing system i think we did not reach peak of what you can really do with the system that we've built oh i don't think we're anywhere near best practices or or knowing even the potential of what we've yes. got so how how it is right now to work with it it's still it's not there like if you pick up Drupal 7 and you just... It's still... Country modules are still not there. Not all of them are there. Um, some of them are failing. But again, I feel that's a good thing. It's good that you you have to sometimes go out of your comfort zone. So... And it gets better. It's yeah. now you have to... You have to tackle through. It's you have to figure out how things work. But at the end, you're learning on that way. You're still learning. You're improving, and that's really important. Contribute back. If you realize something is broken and doesn't work, just don't fix it for yourself. Tell at least your all your teammates, and also tell the world. Write a blog post, write a patch, or whatever it is. If we all do that, we help each other and make it faster. And and we will be there where we right now with Drupal 7 that you that all the modules just work together and you have no broken country. We will be there in the in the, in the next six months. And that fast, yeah, I believe so. So um, and comparing that to previous releases, um, interesting. I find it really interesting that we talk with community people now who actually never saw a major release before. And I see some of the things that people are complaining about. I'm like. You weren't here when Drupal 6 came out. <laughs> and we didn't have any Views module for eight or nine months because Views 1 wasn't ported and Views 2 wasn't ready. Every Drupal 5 site worth its salt was built with um, Views Panel CTK, right? And then <gasps> Drupal 6 kind of just... <laughs> nobody could do it. Like, it felt terrible. Drupal 7 uh, took a year for Contrib to really catch up. Yes, so, yes. But Drupal 8 is right from the beginning is fully tested. It's it's very, very stable and it's got incredible stuff out of the box. All of the authoring experience, all of the multilingual yeah. stuff, um, everything's entity. So actually in terms of data structures or whatever, there's, yes. there's an yeah. awful lot there. And one of the things that was really ensuring for me that we went the right path. I was sitting in DrupalCon Barcelona at the sprint table and there was a guy working there and sprinting and I was working there. At one point he asked me, he asked me a question like he came to me and said, like, "Can I ask you a Drupal question? Because you look like somebody that knows Drupal." And I was like, "Wait, see this face? <laughs> it looks like he knows about Drupal." So and I was asking, "Wait, so you're coming to the sprints?" And I, I I don't remember the question, but with the question asked, he asked me like something completely like about a standard Drupal thing, and I was asking me like, "Wait, where are you coming from? Like, who are you?" And he said, "You know, I, I'm." I'm a Symphony developer. I came to the Symphony tracks and they heard I have a sprint. And I, this morning I opened the first time Drupal 8. And he wrote a patch that went into core two days later. Wow! And I was talking about that in the past that we will have the possibility to add new people out of the blue that know PHP and they will be able to contribute and work in Drupal 8. And in front of me, right. I saw it immediately. And he said, and I asked him, like, hey, how does it feel? Like, in terms of. How crazy it is, because you know, we talk all about this Drupalisms and how Drupal 7 has like this learning curve that actually you fall down there three times before you make it. And and he said, well, it's like it's a different flavor of PHP. Um, but all of them are different flavors. But overall, he can read through it, he can read the APIs, he can he can understand it. And that was something that I saw, wow, that's that's gonna be so great for us for the community. And I cannot wait to see 
what's going to come out yeah. of that. And I can say that the PHP people are really, really curious about us. And 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 um, Camel Vertesi and I, for example, have been out there trying to convince PHP people not please don't write another custom CMS application <laughs> for your for your for your your big project. Just drop Drupal eight in there, you, front end or not, whatever. It's got so much great yeah. content management, you know, tools stuff in it, um, and and the you can just drop that in and use it, and it really works. Yeah. yeah. That's so exciting. It's yeah. so exciting. Hey, man, it's great. Thank you for stopping by today. It's been really, really good to talk with you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. So. What was in there? Apple chutney. Mmm, right? Can you taste it? <laughs> this is my apple chutney latte. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure you can get one in Portland. Oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs>